948. 948. Thank you, James. You know, it's uh, amazing to me sometimes whenever I, whenever I'm studying and getting ready for a lesson that uh, things will come to my head. So let me, let me share with you what the schedule for our summer is going to be. June the 30th, we will have a combined singing here uh, with uh, area-wide congregations. That's why we're not having the singing on the first Sunday night of this month. But uh, we will be having an area-wide. So after the area-wide, we're going to be uh, serving sandwiches, uh, chips and dips and drinks. So be ready for that as it comes out in the bulletin this next week. And as we continue to do that, we're going to have, uh, we're going to expect about uh, five to 600 here, hopefully. And uh, see what we can do about having uh, that kind of scene. We have Western Hills is also going to be planning on being here for sure. Other congregations throughout uh, our town and city and our area. We're excited about that. And, and, uh, and then on the months that we don't have a fifth Sunday, uh, we will continue to have our first Sunday uh, singings uh, in those months. So that's to let you know what's coming up. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll be spending a, our evening looking at this passage of Scripture. The other night I was laying in bed and I was praying. And it was not an unusual thing for me to be doing at that time of night. We were getting ready to, uh, for sleep and we'd turn the TVs off and then the house was quiet and Lisa was already falling asleep. I could tell that her breathing had gotten heavier and I laid there and I was talking to God and I finished my prayer and about 30 seconds later I heard swoosh and it was in the house and I couldn't figure out what it was. I got to thinking about something that Chris called me about and thought, well, no, he wouldn't have done that. And uh, I was excited because I thought, man, this is, this is something going on in my house. And I jumped up out of bed and I, I didn't turn on any lights, but I was really strange because I, did, I usually grab my shotgun. I really do. So don't come, you know, if you don't, don't come to my house and tease. But I didn't do it. I just, I got up and it didn't sound like that kind of sound. I couldn't figure it out. I, I looked around, looked around, looked around, looked all the house, couldn't figure anything out. Looked outside, the dogs weren't barking, nothing. I said, man, if the dogs aren't barking, there's nothing wrong. So I went to sleep. Went back to bed, went to sleep. Next morning I got up and I had to go to the bank. It was Friday morning. Went to the bank and sat there and got everything, you know, taken care of. Got back home, noticed that Lisa had made herself some coffee more than what I, I made her. I make coffee every morning for my wife. Just guys, y'all just know that. Just letting you know, ladies, I take care of Lisa most of the time when she tells me to. Um, but uh, she had made another, I thought she had made another cup of coffee and I was looking at, and I looked up again and I realized that our cabinet looked like this and was sitting on top of my coffee pot. She didn't make another cup of coffee. I thought she did, but she didn't, you know, she didn't make a whole pot and I thought, man, what's going on? And uh, today, James came by to look at it and said, yeah, I can fix that and it won't take long. And so we're gonna, he's going to fix that Monday for me. I appreciate that. But it got me to thinking about tonight's lesson. It really did. And I want you to think about it because see what happened was on the back of this thing, it wasn't very well put together. It looked good. It held a lot for a long time. For 18 months, we've lived there, and the same amount of stuff that was in there is in there 18 months ago. It's not in there now. I took it all out. And James looked at that today and said, man, you got a lot. Of, he said he's trying to figure out what are all the dishes doing everywhere. He didn't realize I'd taken everything out. He thought, man, we're messy people. If I want Lisa to know that, I'll tell her. Edit that out, would you, John, please? Uh, I, I've got, I've got, I took everything out of the cabinet, so it's just cabinets that you, know, you can move but it, when I looked at it, it was put together very poorly. And I thought, man, well, that's, that's sad. And the, the product that it was put together with was not the best product. It was subpar what I would have normally wanted in my own house. So I got to thinking about that. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 together. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. 
For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What after all is Apollos, and what after all is Paul, only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each his task? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants, the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For you are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one of you, or each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of his age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight, as it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ. And Christ is of God. You know, so many times... Whenever I think about Christians and I talk to people about Christians, you know, whenever I first became a Christian, people talked to us about the fact that we were an army. How many of y'all know, I'm in the Lord's army? Yes, sir, yeah. And we're gonna shoot the artillery. We're gonna ride in the cavalry. We're gonna fly over the enemy. And those are all good things. Nothing wrong with that. We are supposed to be an army. And it teaches us that. We sing onward Christian soldiers. We read, put on the whole armor of God. And that the word of God is a sword rightly dividing. But imagine Christ, if we were troops, and we were out here and he said, all right, everybody get in formation. And we all stood there and some of us have been in the service and some of us hadn't. Some of us know how to stand. Some of us don't. I don't. I mean, I did not band and I did not Boy Scouts, but I don't know how to stand. But Imagine if Christ reviewed the troops, brought us all out there and said, okay, everybody get in line. Troops who are supposed to be fresh and ready for battle. But some have fairly recent wounds, like they've already been in battle. Some of them have nicks in their armor. Some of them are missing parts of their armor. Not only that, they're missing limbs. Some of their arms are in slings. Some are in casts. Some are bleeding profusely. And on and on we could go. But as Jesus is reviewing the troops that are supposed to be fresh and ready for battle, he said, what's the matter here? Why are the wounded... Why are there wounded already? Why are there people who are already wounded? We haven't even gone out to the battle yet. See, the idea that Abraham Lincoln said a house divided cannot stand was not original with him. Yeah, he stole that just like he, you know, we all steal things all the time. 
that right, Willis? Y'all remember that? You remember that, Chris? No. How many of y'all remember? Ain't that right, Willis? Okay. I got Mike in the back. He's raising both hands, so that's good. We pick things up from people. Abraham Lincoln didn't get that on his own. A house divided cannot stand. We attribute that quote to him, but he got it from God. That's a godly principle. Taught right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Jesus said it almost 2,000 years earlier. Paul is just repeating what God had shared with him so that Paul could share it with the Christians of Corinth who were having difficulty being ready for battle because they were having trouble getting along with each other. And I am so glad that we don't have that today. Everybody always gets along and everybody's fine and everybody's 100% spiritual and, and we don't have any problems with anybody and nobody's upset with anybody and everybody, I mean, you could trust your neighbor that you're sitting by, right? It happens. We don't always get along. But that's family, isn't it? Do you know the people that you argue with the most are the people you love the most? Do you realize that the people that you spend more time arguing with and having discussions that are heated, as we would call them, come because you are more comfortable with that person than you are anybody else? That's why husbands and wives have spats. I met a couple one time said, we've never had a crossword. I said, whoa, really? I said, no, we've never had an argument. I said, okay, who gives in first? And the husband said, I do. And she said, no, I give in. He said, no, I do all the time. You do not? Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. They had an argument. I said, see, how many times have you done that? You just had one. We all have them. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to, to differ and have those little spats. Those are okay. But remember, Jesus is inspecting the troops. And he's not seeing just little scratches of the armor. He's seeing broken arms, missing limbs, armor missing, blood flowing. He's talking about those kinds of situations. And yeah, we do have those in the church. It's true in any religious body. There are religious people in this world who can't get along so much that they'll kill each other. They have the same faith, they have the same beliefs, they have the same understanding of God's word, but, or their idea of God's word, but they do what? They disagree, therefore they're going to fight against each other. God says that's not the way we ought to be. Family loyalties involve certain obligations. There are duties that we perform out of love. Young people, you do things for your parents and your grandparents and your uncles and aunts and everything because you love them or so you don't get in trouble. Walter McPeak tells a story, one of two brothers that were fighting in the same company in France. One of them were, was felled by a German bullet during World War I. The one who escaped asked permission of his um, commanding officer to go back and get his brother and bring him back. And he said, he's probably dead. And there's no use in you risking your life to bring in his body. But after further pleading, the officer finally consented and the soldier went out to get his brother and on his way back, he was getting shot at and, and everything, you know, and he got back and right as he crossed the lines, they laid him down and his brother died. Right as he got back, the commanding officer looked up and said, see, I told you it was a waste of time and effort. He said, no, he said, uh, I did expect I did what he expected of me, and I have my reward, he said. See, when I crept up to him and took him in my arms, he said, Tom, I knew you would come. I just knew you would. There you have the gist of it all. Somebody here expects something fine and noble and unselfish of you. You, me, us. Somebody sitting here tonight expects something fine and noble and unselfish from us. That makes me happy. 
someone expects us to be faithful. 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 How old do you have to be before you're considered faithful? How long a Christian do you have to be before you're faithful? I laughed whenever I first became a preacher because faithful was considered being on, being at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and ladies' Bible class if you were a lady. That was faithful. Boy, they were here. They were faithful. Every time the doors were open. May not have done anything during the week, but they were there during church time. I want to tell you something. I can spend three hours with a lot of people doing a lot of acting and have the rest of the hours of the week to do whatever it is I want to do and act to whatever I want to act and fit the mold of a faithful Christian if that's true. Faithful is more than being at church attendance. Well, they're not very faithful. They're never here. <laughs> and that's sad that that's the mark of faithfulness. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that that adds to it, but that's not what God's talking about. What he's talking about is the question is, are we ready for more than milk? To get ready for the day's lesson I did, I went home and I had milk. I actually drank my first glass of milk in months, maybe even a year. I don't drink milk by itself very often. It was good. It was cold. It was refreshing. I thought it was, I thought it was great. It made me feel good. And I, you know, and, and I thought, man, that, I'm going to have to do that more often. And then I realized I'm going to have to get on the scales tomorrow morning and said, no, nah, probably not. Um, but are we ready for more than milk? Are we ready for more than milk? Are we faithful enough to understand the need of God to be represented by our actions toward each other and those outside of Christ? I mean, so many times our good actions only show at certain times, at least three times a week. We're here. We're faithful. We're good. We got that smile on. Preacher's got us where we don't have to frown, so I got a smile now, but I got it. Picked it up out of the car. It's like our tag we put on, you know. I put my smile on. I'm going to be all right. Get out of the car. Take it off. Put it down. Put it back on when we get back. At other times, our actions may not show our faithfulness to the world, and it may not show it to the church because of our jealousy and quarreling with each other. We get caught up in following whoever's popular at the time, and we forget to only follow Christ. See, men are worldly, unholy, and undeserving of followers. I had a preacher from a denominational church one time said, uh, how many followers do you have? I said, four. And he looked at me and says, really? Aren't you a full-time preacher? Yeah. And you've only got four followers? Yeah. And they said, he said, I just can't believe it. I thought that building held a lot more than that. And I said, it does. Oh, you're talking about the church building. I said, yeah. He said, oh, I that's for my kids. And he said, no, I meant your members. I said, they're not my followers. Well, aren't you your, their shepherd? I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm their brother in Christ. We had a good long discussion about that. Because, see, he was wondering who my followers were. But, you know, the more I thought about that, the more I realized we all have followers. Maybe not to the point that we would think of in a denominational sense. But people that we see, that we want to be like, that we want to understand, that we want to try to emulate our lives after, who are members of God's family, who are great pillars in the church. Men who are not worldly, men who are holy, men who are deserving of note, note, the notice that we give and the honor to whom honor. 
They live good lives. But worldly, unholy, and undeserving of followers the way that God describes men of the Old Testament. If we find the idea that working together works because it makes our task simpler, wouldn't we be better off to understand that? Paul said that he planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. That means when we work together, it doesn't matter what the results are. God's going to give us the results. We may not see the fruit of the labor that we spend our entire lives on while we're here, but it's coming. You know, I don't know what my grandchildren are going to face whenever they get to be my age and have their own grandchildren. It's a fearful thing for me. But I hope that my life has influenced them enough that someday down in the road that they will be able to influence their grandchildren, hopefully in the same way. It'll come. We may not see the fruit of the labor that we spend our lives trying to bear while we're here, but it's coming. It'll come in Fort Worth. It'll come to the church here at West Freeway with many of these people that we are sitting beside gone. The fruit will come. The question is, is do we want to be a part of the progress or the anchor that holds it back? Each are going to be rewarded for what they do. No responsibility can be left undone. I'm constantly thinking about this passage in Romans chapter 12. And it comes to mind in, in verses 6 through 8. In fact, the whole chapter really, but verses 6 through 8. It says, we all have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. See, the sad thing is, is that what he says back here in 1 Corinthians in verses 16 through 23 is that division between us will destroy us. And when will we as humans ever see that? Anytime we divide or have a division in the church, it destroys years of work and time given by so many who have come before and can be a cause of a destroyed faith in the future. There's a lot of things going on in our brotherhood. A lot of change. But we know that wisdom of the world is foolishness. In verse 20 in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, The Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the word, world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. We cannot be one true church and be divided. So how else should we be seen by the world and by those we come in contact with every day? Well, in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians in verse 1, it says, So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. The question is, how are we doing? Do our friends and neighbors know that we're diligent in what we do? Do our lives show others the true servant of Christ that we should? Or do they see a part-time believer? Oh, they're faithful. They, they're there every time the doors are open. Do we live our lives outside the building differently than we do inside? We've been entrusted with the secret things of God to share with the world. The question is, is when will it begin? Remember my cabinets I was talking to you all about earlier? I told Lisa, I said, now I know why those things fell. She goes, why? I said, you got three sets of dishes in them. Dishes are heavy. 
I said, I know they're heavy. She said, well, they've got to go somewhere. I said, yeah, but that wasn't made for that. She goes, I didn't know that. And it fell. By the way, James, I've already got one of those in a box, and they're not going to be up there anymore. I told her, I said, do you know what would have happened if she, if they was all would have fell on the, on the floor? She said, yeah, we'd have lost dishes. And I said, yeah, but we would have been able to replace them with the ones out in the garage, the other four sets we have. Literally, not a joke. Those cabinets looked faithful. We put faith in them. They seemed sturdy. They looked sturdy. They held it for 18 months. And it tried. And it held on until it just couldn't bear the weight anymore. Now, some of us are like that. We've been bearing the weight that we can't bear because we know, we know we're not what we need to be. We carry it around with us, and we try, and we try, and we try. And God tries to take it out and say, let me take some of that away from you. No, 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 I got it. I, I can do it. Some of our brothers come to us and say, hey, let me take some of that burden. No, no, I've got it. I don't need you. I don't need you to be involved in my life. I'm me. I, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. And comes the day that all of a sudden we wake up and we're no longer useful. Remember the coffee pot I told you about? I'm so thankful for that coffee pot. Because of that coffee pot, I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time sweeping, broken things up. See, there are brethren in this world that are like that coffee pot. They're there to help pick you up and hold you up to keep you from destroying yourself. Without that coffee pot under there, we'd have had a mess. It's bad enough as it is. It's going to take some loving, tender care to get it back to where it needs to be. Somebody that knows what they're doing. But what if, what if it had fallen all apart? How are you doing? Are you falling apart inside? Are you having a hard time loving the brothers the way that you should? Understanding what God's Word's talking about? Are you still worried about the milk of the Word instead of trying to figure out what in the world it is that we need to be doing in our lives to further the kingdom of God? What are we going to do? We're going to have to make a decision to do more to do more to be more to accept more and be responsible for more it's not enough just to be faithful it's not enough just to be known as somebody that can be counted on it's time for us to act like God's children Sure, there's going to be times when we're not going to get along. We're not going to agree. But God said, love me. Let the world see your love for each other. And they'll know you're Christians because of it. It may be the night that you need to change your life. Whether it's just between you and God or if you need to come down front or if you need to talk to one of the shepherds or anyone, don't wait. We're here to be the coffee pot tonight. And it may be sometime in the future that I need a coffee pot. And I'm going to call on you. But we're here for you. Don't forget that. Because when life falls apart, there's always something there that will help us if we'll let it. If you need to come tonight, we're going to sing the song of invitation to do just that, to invite you to do so. If we can help you in any way, come while we stand and while we sing.